Wow. Nice to have you all. Oh, nice, 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 nice. Yes, the background is different. Thank you to me, you noticed. <laughs> yes, Shami. So I'll tell you the story. This friend of friend, sister of mine, she's um <laughs> I was going to say she's not kid, but she's not, I mean she's just a daddy. She said to me that you know, I'm tired of seeing the same background, that your background is boring, you know, that everything else is on point, but the background is boring. So I want you to change your background. So that's why I changed the background. I had to rearrange everything there. So that's why you've got this background. I hope you guys like it. <laughs> Hello, sis, Yemi C, Pastor Yemi C. <laughs> she is, in fact, she, she actually went through the Instagram, all the um, sessions we had done. And she said, tick, tick, this one. Okay, your earrings, your hair, your tops, everything. She said, but the only thing is that background that is boring. So we want you to have something <laughs> different. <laughs> so, Lavide, this is for you. I'm not sure if she's on. And guess what? This sister friend of mine, she doesn't even have, she's not on Instagram. She has to borrow her, friend, her, her son's Instagram <laughs> and don't enjoy <laughs> Oh, my goodness. But yeah, so we're back again. Yes, 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 yes. Before our guest um, tone comes on, how are you all doing? I mean, here in England, the weather's changed. Today, it was about six degrees. I don't know what it's, what it's like. I know Nigeria is probably still warm, but people in America, is it cold there now? Because it's changed here. It is, it's cold. It was cold this morning. Um, so, yeah. I hope you're all keeping safe and still practicing social distancing and all of that stuff because we really can't afford to have a second wave. It's cold in your study. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite cold here. I know, getting out of bed now that it's cold is just, oh, I don't want to do this. But um, anyway, before um, we, before I bring on my guest, I hope she, I can't, I haven't seen that she's joined. But I was, you know, every time I think about um, Hangout Cafe and I think about all the, it's wet in Nigeria. Oh, wow. Okay. So that means it's cooler. It's not that hot. Okay. That's good. Yes. Yeah, so every time I think about Hangout Cafe and I think about all the guest baristas that we've had, I just really marvel and I thank God for them because it's not easy coming up here to be vulnerable, you know, sharing your story. But, you know, when I think about it, I think, when you share your story, you own it. So no one can come. I told you, so no one can come and share your story the way they want. You've owned it. So it's your story. So I'm really happy about that. And, um, and my prayer is that every story would help someone to get out of their rot, you know, to be, to become who God wants you to be. When I think about hunger Cafe, I think, I mean, the tagline I would love to use is, developing the wholesome you. you now because a lot of us we have baggages we have things that we're going through but i just pray that as we listen to all the stories that are shared by different people things will change in our lives i will seek help when we um where we need the help so um i am waiting for my guest to join where is she tom if you have joined I can't see you. Uh, let me see if she's joined. So, yeah, okay. Right, I'm sending. Yes, no one can share your story but you. Absolutely. No one can share your story but you. And you own it. And um, my prayer really is that every single one of us will become um, whole, become the person God wants us to be. Um, what's that? Okay. Tom, yeah. Okay. So, yes, I'm excited about um, my friend that's joining us today. Hey, Tom. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Nice to have you here with us. <laughs> How are you feeling? A bit nervous, but I'm good. A bit nervous. <laughs> Listen, you're, you're, you're with family. Every single one here is family. And um, we're all looking forward to you sharing your story and um, 
praying that it would help us to um, to move on from our past and um, welcome. So can we please give Tom a big welcome, a big welcome. I'm sure she's probably feeling a bit nervous, um, but tell her Thank that, you. hey, give her hugs. Yes, please give her a virtual hug, hangout cafe hug. Just tell her how much you, you appreciate her for coming Thank on you. to the vulnerable we know it's not easy but don't thank you thank you thank you so much thank you yes for nice to me. have you can you see all the hugs i can thank you yay 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 yay, yay. Okay. So i'm giving you my own virtual hug too thank, thank you. you thank I you really thanks appreciate, appreciate it mm -hmm. so guys tall is what i've known her since her secondary school days Long time, time. of the okay. I know there's another person or says here. Mm, okay. We all, we all know each other, secondary school days. Um, so <laughs> I think, yeah, after secondary school, we lost touch and then we connected in, mm -hmm. uh, in London, yeah. And mm -hmm. then after a while, we lost touch again and then we connected about three years ago. So go, we connected yeah. properly about three years ago, mm -hmm. just before her daughter got married. And she invited me for the wedding. And I went. I was good to see Renny. <laughs> and Jo is she's been a, always been a lovely person. Very quiet. And she'll explain <laughs> part of some of the reasons why. Um, which is an absolutely lovely lady. So um, let me in, let me tell you what she does so that you guys can have an idea of um, what she, who she is. Um, well, her name is Storm Adams. She's a clinical counselor working with the NHS and she also runs a private practice. She works with clients who present with depression, anxiety disorder, trauma, and bereavement. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, she, that's, that's what she does for a living. That's not who she is. She's just a child of God. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Tom. Mm. We have one, well, now we have about 50 minutes okay. to, for you to share your story. Okay. So tell us what happened soon after you were born. Tell us. Okay, so what I can remember, or what I was told was that at the, when I was six months old, my dad and my mom separated in, here in London. They came here to study and they had me and they separated. So my dad who was a student then and working couldn't cope had to put me up with a foster parent okay. so i think from about six months it might have been earlier i'm not sure it's no, don't want to ask so. so how come your dad had you not your mom when they separated um i understand my mom walked out because she couldn't cope with my dad anymore okay and then she left you with your dad yes okay so your dad looked after well the, your dad now um, put you with foster parents because he was studying and working, yeah, and working at the same time. Yeah. So you went through different foster parents till how old? I went through just one um, until I was four. Um, okay. Yes, my foster parent was living in Harlow. Okay. Um, so my dad took me away from her when I was four because he was returning to Nigeria and he took me with him. Okay, so at four years old, you went back to Nigeria. But yeah. I remember you said that you had older siblings, but yes. they were left in Nigeria. They were left in Nigeria. My three brothers were left in Nigeria when my parents were coming here to study. Okay. And they were, they were left with um, family members on my mom's side. Okay, so there are four of you up together, three boys, one, one girl. girl. You're the only one. girl. Yeah. Okay, so tell us, you went back to Nigeria with your dad, and what happened? Um... As soon as we got to Nigeria, we went by, by, by sea. I had to go and live with a nun. You went by sea? I went wow. by sea, River, Ni <laughs> River Niger, I can't forget. Wow. And I, was, I went to live with a nun. Uh, I was with the aunt for four years. So and eight years, okay. That's eight years. And then I moved back to my dad when I was eight. My dad used to come and visit me and my aunt, um, mm. my brother's. Up till the time you went back to Nigeria, up till before you were, okay, when you were still in England, up till you, when you were your foster mother, yeah. I say, did you have any contact with your mother? Um, from photographs I have, old photographs, she used to come visit. 
Okay. So I have some blood pressure she's come visit, and I can I can recollect those you events. Can recollect, mm -hmm. but it was just the photographs that I yeah. Used, she used to come to visit. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then when you went to Nigeria, up to eight, did she end contact? She didn't turn up until I was ten. I was living with my dad then, and she, she turned up. She knocked on the door, and I opened the door, and I thought, "What's this woman looking for?" My dad's gone to work. My dad had lots of girlfriends. So that another one, what do you want? She's gone to work. He's gone to work. And my brother pulled me by and said, that's your mother. I was like, oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Mm. She, what did she say to you then? I don't know if she said much to me. I think she, I can remember her going for my brother's big hugs. For my brother's, I can't remember our interaction. I think it's something I've suppressed because when my dad got back from work yeah. there was an incident outside because she was downstairs no, she, she, they, they met they, she had to go downstairs to meet him okay. and say hello and he wouldn't listen to her she stood in front of the car to talk to him and he just drove sort of tried to drive into her wow. so that incident is there so i think i just suppressed the whole her visit you know, when, when when i was 10 Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what else? Life continued after she, so she left. She Life went continued. back to England? Yes, yes. Okay. And then she turned up again when, in between those times, my dad remar remarried. So the stepmom in the house now. Okay. And then my mom turned up when I was 13. Uh, I went to live with her because home with stepmom was, was hell. So I went to live with my mom for a year. We didn't really get along. For a year, that was when I was 13, and she died when I was 15. So were you living with her when she died? No. We, um, I was with her for a while. I think she died a few months after I went back to my dad's, because we just weren't getting along. But I guess that's understandable, because you hadn't lived together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, she would go to the hospitals and say, I'm going to see your uncle, uncle, uncle Ade. I'm going to see your uncle. I'm waiting in the car with the driver, not knowing that she had breast cancer, she was going for treatment. Wow. Yeah. She didn't tell you? She didn't tell me. Wow. So after she died, we were told, she, she came, someone came home and told us she died. And um, at that point, I wasn't connecting with anything. It was, it was as if I was floating. I wasn't connecting. She, she died. And then to got what I was going to wear. We went for the burial. I did go to the mortuary to see her body. You did? I did. I did. And um, I can still see it. It's in my head. I can still see it. But nothing was explained. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I can keep on saying I don't know. I don't know. Nobody but, explained what happened to you. Like, how are you feeling? Or what's going on with you? Or this is what's happening. Or this is what happened in the mortuary. Or this is what they did. Nothing. There's nothing. So we went through the motion of seeing the body, of going for the funeral alone. And that's it. And life goes on. So you went back to your dad now? Yeah. Okay. So what was that like, living with your dad and stepmom? Well, it, it's from the time my stepmom moved in, my dad changed. He, he used to be my dad and I. Okay. I went to Maywood. Imitra went to Maywood because it was near his office. I was meant to go to Queen's College. My mom went to Queen's College. Yeah. But my dad won't let me go to Queen's College because it, it was just the two of us. Okay. So it was just my dad, I, and two houseboys. That's, that was life, and it was fun until my stepmom turned up, and it just switched on negative. It just became something else immediately. And you know that sto the stories you hear about stepmoms? Yeah. Well, I had the worst. I had, she just didn't care. I don't know what it was. He had um, own kids. But it was that. It was where you want wanted, you wanted to talk to your own dad. And it's like, no, you can't talk to him. Or, but she didn't allow you to talk to your dad when you wanted to. Yeah, do. I'll tell him, what do you want? I'll, I'll ask him on your behalf. And she would say what she wants. And it became something else. Mm. It became toxic. It, uh, my, my, I went to Keikotu Primary School and my scores just went down and I didn't really care because no one was listening. I was like, it doesn't matter if I pass or fail. So 
I just do whatever. Wow. Now, as an adult, understand that I would dissociate them. So I'll be there, but I won't be present in anything. Right. So that was life till all the what way to when I moved. This time? My brothers were boarders in Ibadan. They all went to school in Ibadan, but they would come home okay. for summer holidays and all that. Okay. Just summer holidays. I think they purposely stayed away sometimes mm -hmm. because of the environment. Yeah. So did your stepmother have her own children? Yeah, she has five. We lost one. Yeah, mm -hmm. she had the twins. Yeah. So was there a way, was there a difference rather? As in, in the way she brought up her children and living with Oh, definitely. I had my own kitchen from the age of 13. She won't cook for us. She won't cook for my... Oh, sorry, you had, I had my own kitchen. kitchen. Yeah. Wow. When, so you um, had to cook? I had to cook for myself. Cook. I had to go to the market. I had to go to the market. Wow. Yeah, she won't cook for us. She won't. She did um, set the table after my mom died for like a week. We all sat together and after we said, I can't do this anymore. And that was it. She said she couldn't do this anymore. Mm. Wow. Yeah. My goodness. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm shocked. Okay, I'm so sorry. So, um, so you had to start looking after yourself. And my brothers, I would Your cook brother. for myself. By this time they had finished uh, maybe uni or secondary school or they were at home a lot now in Lagos. So I, I cooked for my brothers. I went to the market and I cooked for them. And we had an apartment at the back, like the boys' quarters. So I was the one doing the cooking, cleaning. So, sorry, were you living in the boys' quarters or just... The boys' quarters. My, we moved from Suleri when I was eight. We were in Ojoelegba and then we moved to Okwadi. Okay. So there's a boys' quarters that built this big house and we took over the boys' quarters because... How old was... were you then when you were living in the boys' quarters? When you guys were living in the boys' quarters? 15, At 15, 13, 14, 15, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not living in the main house, you're living in the boys' quarters. Yeah, the boys' quarters became our apartment, our own apartment, wow. our own space, yeah. So that means when your brothers went back to school, you were alone there? By that time, they had all finished and moved home. They were now working or they were in uni. Most of them, they were What's working. What's the age gap between you and your brothers? Uh... Five, the eldest, uh, I can't, I can't ten, no, seven, ten, eight, I can't remember, I can't remember. But the last one, you're me and I, there's five years between us, four years, sorry. Okay, and then so six, you and then seven, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. right. yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. I remember you, when we were talking, you said there was a story, something to do with the twins, because your stepmom had a two. So when we were living in Sudere and my stepmom moved in, not long afterwards, she had, um, she had the twins, she had two boys, and she, she was a caterer, so she would bake for, for long hours into the night, and her kids would be crying, and she'd make me sit there with the twins. I, I, can't, go to, I can't go to bed, and I had to go to school the next day. Wow. And it, I just have to sit there, I can't eat, I can't do my homework. I can remember my homework was all over the place. I can remember once she finished baking and it was about 12 and she took one of the twins from me and I said, I still haven't done my homework. And she quickly wrote something there. And that's what I submitted at school. She wrote on your book? Yeah, like, yeah, that's what I submitted at school. So I wasn't getting good sleep. I was in, there was no support. My needs weren't attended to. Yeah. What about your, I know, okay, your, mom, your mother's side, did anybody, who, did, you didn't have anyone to talk to your mother's side or the family? My, my mother's side were used to the boys, to my brothers, because they grew up with them. Yeah. They didn't really know me. But even if they wanted to help, my dad was, my dad was controlling, everyone was scared of him, so... And I think the, the hatred he had for my mom, he would project it onto anyone who was from her side or supported her. Okay. So they did try to help. They tried, but most of the time they stayed away. My brothers would go to them and spend time with them. Okay. They interacted, but I didn't have that relationship with them. And of course, by now, the relationship with your dad was like non-existent? None. It was... 
what? You know when you're scared of authority figure? Yeah. Yeah. That was how I grew up. Mm. I mean, well, you went to school. Nobody knew what was really going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. I don't think I could, I would have been able to explain to you guys what was going on. Okay. Because I didn't have the words. One, two, I would come to my friend, I would go to my friend's houses and see how things were normal there. So I had, I was carrying around a lot of shame. Mm. That if only my, why can my home be like this? And even people who weren't as well to do, they don't have big homes. They were happier. There was love in the home. I was always welcome. I felt happy there. Never wanted to go home. But I couldn't explain that. You're okay, I'm, like that. I'm going home now, but I don't know what's going to happen as soon as I get home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Timmy Deering said, I always thought you and your pops were close. Yeah, I mean, yeah too. that's what everyone thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, this is just so it's terrible. Okay, so go on. What else happened? You finished? You finished? Did you? F- you, you had to repeat a year, I remember. Is yes, I repeated um, Form 3. Okay. And that was the year my mom died. And of course, oh. we thought to um, um, help you with cancelling and all of them. I guess at that time, I guess nobody was into anyone. Else. There, was, there was nothing like that. I think it did spread through the school that my mom died. Okay. But nothing was in, in place for that. Um, I remember two friends that, that always supported me. They were always there okay. in their own way. Okay. And I think that's, that's how I survived that year. Um, I, I used to dissociate. I would be in class, but I won't be there, present. So they would tell me what to write. We're going for lunch. This is what we're going to do. Let's go and sit down there. I just followed them around. They just carried me along. Um, light on. My turn, Esther. Thank you. Okay, this was when you repeated. That's when I repeated. You guys were in from four. Wow. So, yeah. My goodness. Okay, so eventually you finished. I finished. Was there anything else that happened before you finished? Um, it's 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 the same. From the beginning, it was the same old um getting negative responses from my dad. It was the, you're going to fail anyway, you're stupid. Um, this was your dad? This was my dad. Um, I would ask for, I would have a list of books to, to buy for school and he would say, why do you want to waste my money? You're going to fail anyway. Oh, why can't you be at your friends? There was a lot of comparison. But then I didn't understand what was going on with him, I didn't know why he felt like that. I didn't, there was no support and I didn't know how to ask for mm. anyone for support. Mm. But what amazed me most then was that even the aunties and the uncles I could have gone to yeah. would support my dad because they were scared of him. So it was whatever they said, there was nobody to run to. Okay. They pro- were probably, I guess he was probably, um, he probably had the money and- yeah. mm-hmm. So, and he was tough, very controlling, very tough. So it was whatever he, he says that matters. So there was no support. So I had to do things on my own. I had to make my mistakes. I had to assume, learn from them. Yeah. I can remember my dad saying, Somebody like, said, it sounds like your dad was jazzed. <laughs> <laughs> so... And getting older, it was... Um, don't worry. You're, all you guys asking all this question, where's your dad now? Where's your stepmom? Don't worry, she'll get to that. You'll get to it. <laughs> so it was more like, don't, I saw you talking to a guy. They don't, there's, they only want to sleep with you. They don't want anything else from you. Mm-hmm. If you look at the guys, they're going to get pregnant. It was all negative. There was nothing encouraging. So... I know now that was never present well, yeah, in myself. What about your older brothers? If I'm going through stuff like that, yeah. they were going through theirs as well. Right. We all didn't have a mom. We all didn't have support. You didn't have the mom or dad. We all, or the dad that would support us. We were all going through it in our own different ways. 
So we can sit down, my brother and I, and we'll sit down and talk about what we used to go through then and laugh. Well, we can laugh now, okay. but then everybody will, you're, you're your own kind of thing. just trying to survive, I guess. Exactly, yeah. Wow. Okay, so um, tell us how you left, what happened like, when you left Nigeria. So after Mary Wood, I did receipt several times and I, all I did was fail. Oh, fail. Let me see about to receipt. Failed. failed. And then one day, my aunt, or I thought she was my aunt, said to my dad, Well, you, you, you said you thought she was my aunt. aunt. Well, I thought she was my aunt. But, and she said, why don't you send her to London to study so she can get out of your hair? She's British, isn't she? My dad agreed and they got my ticket. But by that time, I had a boyfriend. Okay. And something had happened. I don't know. I can't even tell you what happened, but something had happened. <laughs> I don't <think> I <laughs> something had happened. And I was pregnant in denial. That, this is not pregnancy. It's going to disappear tomorrow. But I couldn't tell anyone. There was no one wow. to go. Through. I think I told one friend. Okay. And we tried different things. We swallowed it this and swallowed that. Yeah, nothing okay. happened. Anyway, so... And every day I would How just go... For... That? Sorry, how old were you when you got pregnant? I was 20, going on 20, 19. Okay. 20, I was 20. Okay. I was 20. So anyway, my dad had bought the tickets one day. They, no one told me. And I'd gone for work as usual. And I came back home and they locked the doors and they said, pack your stuff. So I couldn't you tell anyone. They, they locked you in the room and said... Pack yeah, they locked the gates. The Miguel locked the gates. My brother... Okay, so that you couldn't run away. I couldn't run away. <laughs> So they said, pack your stuff, you're traveling tonight. Wow. And that was it. I traveled with my dad to Iberia. I can't forget. I didn't say a word. I knew I was pregnant. I didn't say a word. Wow. And we got to London to see my aunt who were on our way to America. Okay. We got to my aunt. My aunt said, she's British. Why don't you let her stay here? And that was, I stayed in London. My dad went off to America because of his planned trip. Wow. And he returned to Nigeria. And then four, or four months later, four, five months, four months later, he came back with this aunt who I thought the was The one aunt. who had suggested you should come Yeah. To okay. And they came to my aunt's place. This, 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 that's where they stay. And um, my aunt walked in, looked at me. I greeted them. And, they said, and she said, this girl is pregnant. Okay. And How far was, gone were you now? Can you remember? Started so rainy December, so that was August. That was summer, August September. So that means you were almost eight months or something. Yeah, August September, maybe like six, six months, six months. Okay. And hell started again. Hell started. Um, I forgot to mention that before I came to London and when I was young, from age eleven. Yeah. No, ten. So about 15, my dad used to whip me with a koboko. Wow. So I would go to a party and I would come back and I would get into trouble and he would beat me. Did and I got... Did you... Okay, I was going to say that. If you knew he was going to beat you, but you still went out anyway. Yeah, because I got used to the whipping. Mm, okay. I got used to the whipping and I'm going to that party. So I go to a party. My brother had taught me how to jump over the wall, the gate, <laughs> and we will get back yes, in. The <laughs> it was like I'm sure then it was like, what the hell? What what could happen? I'll get with him. Fine, okay. Wow. Okay. So we we my dad returned to Nigeria angry. He disowned me. He disowned you. He disowned me. He said he doesn't have anything to do with me. Um, so I don't know if it was because I was pregnant and I didn't tell him. Okay. Smart one, like, oh, this girl wants to show me. She wants to show me up. So this on me. And I was leaving my aunt. I had my daughter in December. And I, she would tell me to write my dad a letter every month to beg him. And I would write them. And you were what? I would write the letters. Okay. Wait, did and he ever respond? No, he never responded. So how did was, you cope financially and everything with the 
baby on the way. Was it your aunt? Or? Um, well, well, as, because you're British. You I'm get, as a British, is, yeah, I got some, we got benefits. I moved out with my daughter when she was a month old. Okay. I got my own place with a friend. A friend encouraged me to move out and get a place. And life started. When you say life started, tell us. I think it's the effects of everything that went on, went on when I was young. Yes. So tell us um, some of these effects. What? How did you manifest? You know, the childhood trauma and all of that. Mm. Now you're a mother yourself. How did you manifest? Just being lost, didn't, not knowing what to do. Just being angry, angry at everyone and anyone I could come across. Depressed without knowing being, I was depressed. And I used to isolate myself a lot, okay. not saying much. <clears throat> but then no one was asking me what was going on with me, and I couldn't tell you either. But, and that went on for a long time. I, I can go to a store, and I'm not attended to properly. I just snap. Okay. I just snap at whomever. I'm very good at cursing people out. This YouTube. Yeah, that was my escape route. Wow. I would cuss them out because I wanted somebody else to feel pain. Mm, because of everything you had gone through. Yeah, like, wow. you don't get it. You don't talk to me like that. You don't. It was just anger at everyone else. Wow. Yeah. Someone just asked a question. Um, did you get in touch with the, your daughter's father? I mean, he, I guess he knew you were pregnant. Did you guys even consider having, getting married or was he involved? Yeah, he was, his, his dad was involved. Um, my parents, my dad and my brother had to go to the home and say, your son has given my daughter, got my daughter pregnant, what's right. gonna happen? And my daughter was accepted. She was the first grandchild in the house then, and according to their tradition, okay. she's the head of the home. So she, she, was, she was accepted. A few years after my daughter's dad came to London okay. and we lived together for a while until we could tolerate one another and then we went our separate ways. But he's always been in my daughter's life. He's always been her dad. No doubt about that. We're just not together. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, okay. So how did it, um, even in raising Rennie, mm. how did it manifest? The, as in uh -huh. your trauma? Um, and how did you cope raising her on your own from well, when she was a month old? Um, she was with me for just a few months before she had to go to a foster parent as well because we couldn't cope. We were young. Her dad and I were young. We didn't know what, was, what we were doing with our lives. So she had to go somewhere where she could be looked after for five years. Okay. We used to go visit her and I think that helped because when a child is in a supportive environment, yeah. that's an, a, a secure attachment is being formed. And I think that helped. Yeah. That helped. And Renia has always been independent, even from young. Okay. So I, I'm grateful to God for the way she's turned out and her life. Once in a while, I'll be angry with her when she was in primary school, but that was my stress, me projecting all my anger onto her. Uh, but she's been good. She, she wasn't like me. She didn't provoke me, so... She didn't? She didn't provoke me in any way. Okay. So I think that helped. Okay. My anger would manifest outside the home more. Not with her, okay. Not with her. Um, and with relationships. So it's the adults I was, I was angry with. Okay, so let's, let's explore this, this anger. What I know you, you said one or two things that because you wanted them to feel the okay. pain. So let's explore this more. What are the kind of things, other things that you used to do just to get this anger out of you? So um, there, there were different things 
first of all, because I didn't understand what was going on with me, we, we never used to talk about childhood trauma then. Okay. A, in Nigeria, if your parents had mistreated you or you've had um, distressing experiences, you would just shut it down and suppress it. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't have those words. I didn't know where the anger was coming from. I didn't know what was going on with me. I had to find out what was going on with me, maybe listening to people or going for workshops. I started working on myself, trying to understand why I was angry for no reason, why I would like to always isolate myself. I didn't want to mix with people. I felt I was being judged. Mm -hmm. So when a friend says something to me, it takes me back to what my dad said to me in the past. And I didn't like that. I felt shamed. I felt being shamed all the time. Yeah, I remember you said when you got pregnant, you felt shamed too. Yeah, because people talked. People, they talked about dif- different things. They said things like, like, oh, she's, she, 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 she went to get pregnant. That's how I can translate it from Yoruba. Okay. That she, she, she went on to get pregnant. is like, what is that? And if other people can say that, then who do I talk to? If that's how they feel. I could see that I'm being judged, I'm being shamed. So I, I had to keep away. Okay. And this took me back to the past, the yeah. same things I went through with my dad. So I had to keep away from everyone. So it's like there's no one to, to talk to. Talk to. Mm. Mm. So um, I remember you said to me that your dad, when did your dad come back into your life? Um, on and off, but he came back... We will talk and not talk for years and then we'll talk. But he came back last, um, 2015. That was the year he died. He died December. Mm, he died December 2015. He came back into my life April because he came to London to sort out some stuff and sell his house and all that. And he, he had to get in touch with me because he needed my help. Okay. So, and, but by that time he had terminal cancer, yeah, prostate cancer. Okay. But did, you didn't know that? I didn't know it was terminal. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know. I knew he was presenting with some things, but I didn't know. So he, he came back to London. And we would talk. I would spend time with him, take him to wherever he wanted to go. And then he had uh, an incident and we had to take him to hospital. And he was told that he had six months to leave. Okay. So I said, you need to go back to Nigeria. You can't die here. If you die here, you have to spend money to get you back home. I don't have time for this. You have to go. So we packed up his stuff. And he came with his wife then. And not my stepmom, another stepmom. Nice oh, one. Oh, what happened to that stepmom? Oh, she left. I had, in between that one and that, I had, I had four stepmoms. Oh, my God. It was one, it's one after the other. But she wow. was the worst. Wow. So, but this stepmom is nice. But so they came. Was... So it's nice. It's nice. So I said, you have to go back and pack the stuff. You're going back tomorrow. I booked the tickets. And then I sat him down. And I gave him a piece of my mind. Exactly. And it was ugly. I confronted him. Okay. Was... I'm still angry that I was crying when I was saying it because I had so much. But because I was crying, I didn't have... I couldn't say as much as I wanted to say. But I did. I asked questions like, if you knew you weren't going to love me and look after bring me up in a loving way. Why did you give birth to me? Mm. Why did you give birth to so many kids? Mm. Why would you do something so, why would you be so evil? I meant to love kids. Mm. I know you must have had a very bad upbringing. It doesn't mean you have to do the same to your kids. They don't have to go through the same thing you went through. Yeah. Life could have been much better. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't ask to, to go through this. Uh, I was crying, I was angry, and, and I told him, and, I, and, and my last sentence is in Yoruba, and you guys will have to translate it. Because my dad was so, was like, he could do anything, doesn't matter. I said something like, I'm already shaking. <laughs> That was my last sentence. Say that again. 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 Say that again.
Um, basically, she's saying that we'll see if you are, who is greater, you or God. Oh, God. Yes. I think that's it in a nutshell. And I left it. Okay. So what did he say when you were talking? Not a word. But put his head down. Put his head down. He couldn't look at me. My dad, who would look at me and curse me, could not look at me. Even when I took him to the airport the next day, that was it. He could not look at me. Wow, yes, who's great are you or God? Yeah. Mm. Wow. Okay. And that was the last time you saw him? I saw him afterwards. I went to... Okay, so he lived longer than the six months that they gave him. No, he, he died six months, exactly. Oh, six months. Okay. Yeah, that is six months. But after probably. that, you went to Nigeria? I was going to Nigeria regularly because my brother had died two years before then and I was sorting out some stuff for him. Oh, yeah. I think I remember you said so. Your brother died. But mm. that was another reason why you were upset with your dad because yeah. he didn't tell us about that. He wasn't. He wasn't there for my brother. My brother was quite, I believe, fragile. He was the firstborn. He yeah. looked like my mom a lot. My dad wasn't supportive. Okay. My dad. My brother died of kidney failure. Right. It it it's, it it progresses. It starts from somewhere. But why couldn't anyone see that he was? going through this i know he, he does he doesn't talk as well because of all everything we go he through we just quite quiet okay. way more quiet than i was so i was i wasn't i wasn't happy with my dad but he didn't he didn't care so yeah did, did your bro, was your brother married no he wasn't married he died when i was 55 he wasn't married no children he died when he was what 55 oh yeah because the age gap wow mm. Your dad wasn't involved in when he was going through all the kidney failure and all of that. I asked him, I said, what are you doing about Yemi? What are you doing? He said, eh, I've sent somebody to pray for him. Or I've told some people to pray. I said, that's all. <sighs> okay. Yes. I'm done. <laughs> you know, I've come to all these things you hear and you know, sometimes like you watch, you know, when you watch all these, especially these Yoruba movies, like mm. you have step mom to behave and all of that. It's just so terrible. It's really, really terrible. And this sort of things are still happening now. Mm. They're still happening now. Yeah. Is your, the step mom that was horrible to you, is she still alive? She is. I saw her during my dad's burial. I went for my dad's burial. Okay. Although I found out later that he disowned the four of us, Marina Kerr's children, my mom. Yes, no, okay. okay. this in his will. In his will, he had this on the four of us. But I, I went for the burial, and um, my stepmom was there. I didn't see her for years, and she was saying stuff along the lines of, "You're the eldest. You should be friendly with each other." And, okay. She <laughs> was, <laughs> now she wants you to be friendly with her. Oh my God. I thought yes. I said I did. I I, I did respond and say yes, ma. Cause the problem, ma. Um, someone just asked, I know after you had that conversation with him in England, was, did you have any other conversation with your dad before he died? Mm, I saw him um, November, he died December. I saw him last November, and by that time, his speech, he couldn't speak anymore. Okay. There were no words. He would look at me and want to say something, because I can it's still, I get flashbacks. He would look at me. And I will go. He's probably sorry now. He probably now he was yeah. like regrets. No words. He was very frail. Wow. Mm. But still, he had the, he, he, <laughs> because I just saw something that Timmy Dere put. He disowned you. If he yeah. really, I mean, I can't, I don't want to judge him because I don't know because he could have made his peace with God, and we know that if you make your peace with God, God will forgive you and all of that. But what I was thinking was he could have changed his will mm. if he really had um, remorse. I understand that what I heard was that every time we had arguments with my dad before yeah. he died, yeah. like the year before or something, he, had, he would go to his lawyer and change the will. He would change them to the extent that the, I think the lawyer said, it's enough. You can't keep on coming back. Wow. So he was stopped from, so anytime he's angry, Tom Soleil, she said this to me, changing, or, yeah. Wow. 
they were cutting you, cut, cutting cut your cutting your everything. Cutting back and yeah. Wow. <sighs> this is a lot. This is a lot. Yeah. Okay, but um let me see. I think we have some questions. Uh yes, we will pray at the end. Um But yes, somebody asked, but how are you today? Tell us how you started this journey of seeking help. You know, there's this quote that I love. It says that um, you're not responsible for the family you're born into and the things you went through, you know, as mm. a child. Mm -hmm. But you're now responsible for who you become. So mm -hmm. how did you take that step to becoming a different person? Where did you, when did you get to that stage where you said, no, 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 I'm not going to be defined by all these things? I always wanted to talk to someone. I always wanted to sit with somebody who would listen to me. So I think in wanting that, I did that with others. When I was training to be a radiotherapist, I would sit with the clients afterwards and talk and ask about the day, what they're going to do. Um, how, how's the journey, cancer journey? Okay. I got into trouble for not doing my work. And someone then said, why don't you just go into counseling or help? You could help the you cancer patients. Busy listening to the cancer patients instead of doing, doing radio therapy. Yeah. And that suggestion coupled with Yemi dying was like, okay, Yemi died that young. Anything can happen to anyone at any time. Mm -hmm. I have to do something with my life. So I changed professions and I started training as a counselor. Okay. And it was tough at first because we have this thing called the ETG group, experiential group, whereby you have to talk about everything. If you don't talk, somebody's going to get to you. They're going to say something that would hurt you. Okay. And you have to open up. Right. And it's brutal, but it's very helpful. So I started training as, as a counselor. And while you're training as a counselor, you have to be in therapy yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's how my journey really started. I can remember the first time I chose my counselor in my area, went to see her. I said, I have to be here because of my course. I don't really want to see you because you cannot handle my issues. You can't handle my stuff. I'm too much. <laughs> I'm still with her. It's been, it's been interesting. It's been Sometimes when, I'm, when we're talking and I'm telling her about an event, she will say, did you see the red mist? She could see the anger when I'm talking. So you saw the red mist. How did you handle it? And we started exploring that. We talked about everything, everything, even things people don't know about me. We were able to explore it. And then you start seeing your own clients, part of the placement. And you start seeing the similarities in people's lives and journeys and how they are going through it and how you can help them. Yeah. It's like, it's healing. Okay. Because somebody else has been through what you've been through and that's, it's, it's, how do I say it? It's, it's nice to see that somebody else, although it's not good events, but yeah. there's somebody else going through what, what I'm going through. through. Yeah. It's not just me. There's yeah. somebody else and yeah. together we can work together and we're looking for solutions and it's possible. Solutions are possible. So yeah, that's been it. You know, I'm so glad you mentioned that. So please, anyone that's watching or listening to us, Tom has been through a lot, but she's on that journey. Of, she's not there yet. I'm sure you're not 100% there. No, no, nobody's but 100%. She's, she's on that journey of turning things around. And if you're there too, if you're here rather, and you've been through this, you have childhood trauma, and, or whatever it is, seek help. And I'm going to ask um, this, and ladies, I'm going to ask to put, that, put on the comment box, um, the, all the therapists that I know, counselors, you know, Tom is one, please, her handle is going to be put on, get in touch with her. There's Pastor Jane, there's Dr. Zoe, um, um, Chinaya, Tranquility, um, if you're a guy, uh, just everyone so please get help you can see that even Tom talking about this that you can see that it's still painful but she has started that journey and you know I can't wait for you to come back maybe in a, another year or so where you you know you can say I've come this far you know mm -hmm. another step so what would you say to um, um, parents in particular Tom in terms of because sometimes so, for example, I'm sure maybe you've come um, 
you've um, dealt with parents, uh, adults now. Do you see children at all? No, I don't. Just oh, okay. adults. First no. of all, I'll, I'll start with adults. Adults, okay. I know it's difficult to go back there okay. uh, and connect with your inner child yeah. and remember those things. It's painful. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. But you need to so that you can start exploring the stuff you're dealing with that's holding you down. It makes us feel stuck, like we're going to be judged. Somebody's looking at me and, and you get anxious. Mm -hmm. You feel as if what your parents were saying then was true and it's become you. It hasn't become you. It's, that's what that happened in the past. That was then. What about now? So you have to go there and it might be painful. That's when you need a professional to, to, to go there and explore this stuff. And that's how you can have a happier life because if not, you're going to carry around that stuff. And I know a lot of people would rather leave it suppressed. I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know not everybody. I'm not saying everybody should get up and let's re-traumatize re ourselves. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. I know it can be tough, but baby steps. Mm -hmm. Parents, you can sit down and talk to your kids. There is no reason why you should curse your kids. Like you're stupid, you're this, and compare them. Talk to the child. Listen to the child. Yeah. If the child is being heard and has and is, is being supported at home, there's confidence. They can go out there and be confident. If anybody wants to do what they shouldn't be doing with them, they'll be able to tell the person that, no, 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 my parents didn't bring me up like that. I have parents to call. I have an aunt. I have an uncle. That's not, I know that is not right. Thank you. But when you don't have anybody supporting you, you fall into those kind of situations. You're seeking love in the wrong places. Yeah. If you have love from home, yeah. you wouldn't need that. Yeah. You'll be so sure of yourself. You'll be confident. You'll be, I don't know. I can't think of all those words because my head is spinning at the moment. But parents need to support their kids, caregivers, aunties, whomever. A child should have somebody they can always run to and it's ask important. questions. Yeah. It's important. Anybody, it could be any, it could be uncle. Does, some people don't have parents, so it could be some, a mentor. Yeah. But when they don't have anybody, and they fall, they, have, they, they seek things in the wrong places. Yeah. Someone just, um, home should be your safe place. Yes, mm. your blueprint for the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if things are not right at home, then, wow. Um, yes, oh, I thought, yes, somebody did ask this question. So, did you have other children after any? Yes, tell us um, in the few minutes that we have. Yes, I have two boys, um, Cash and Kazim, young adults. Yeah, <laughs> you got married, but it didn't work out. It didn't work out. Yeah, she got married, but well, that was also because it affects relationships. The whole thing affects relationships. Um, father figure, maybe you, your, your, your husband says something to you and it resonates with what my dad would say with me, and I would get angry. I couldn't handle it. Um, relationships, no. Because I, I, I don't know how. I wasn't taught how. I don't know how it works. Mm -hmm. I am beginning to understand it now, but there's no example. Home was broken. So yeah. what do I take into a relationship? Yeah. There's no blueprint. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have it. I remember when we spoke, you said you had a child and you didn't know what to do with this child. It was like, what am I supposed to do? Not, because yeah. we didn't have an example. And you know, it's interesting because your stepmother would have been, if she had been a good person, that would have been your example of, okay, she mm -hmm. had, you were, there's a 10 year gap between you and your um, yeah, and the twins. The twins yeah. yes. So that would have been your example of seeing how to raise a child. But exactly. I got that. Mm -hmm. Wow, Tom, really, really thank you for coming to share. I've been vulnerable. Okay. <sighs> someone said, I've always felt like I'm under scrutiny and someone is watching me. I had a loving father, but I was quite shy around him. Still affects me till today. Is that, is, who is that? Is that, do you know who that person is? Kola? That's not your brother, is it? Not what everybody is. No? Okay. Mm -hmm. I really do pray to all that, um, God will take you out of this journey um, to that place where he wants you to get to. And I'm believing, you know, as you were talking about how your marriage to work out, I'm believing that 
somewhere down the line, your husband will find you. You will remarry <laughs> in Jesus' name. I really do pray that. I really, really do pray that. And in the few minutes that I have, and let me just pray for every single person that's here that's gone through or going through one thing or the other. Father, we really want to thank you for your daughter who's been so vulnerable, who has shared. And even while she was talking, Lord, we could feel the pain that she went through. Thank you, Father, Lord God, for taking her out to bring her into the place that you want her to be. I really pray for her, oh Lord God Almighty, that you set her free, that you lose her from the trauma of the past, oh Lord God Almighty. And for anyone who's listening to us today, oh Lord, who's tuned in and who will listen probably later on, Father, I pray that you set them free, oh Lord. Set them free from the past, set them free from the pain. Holy Spirit, I ask that you enable them to seek help. Give them the courage to seek help. And even as they seek help, you will give them the grace to go through the process because it's a process that needs to, they need to go through. Father, I commit your daughters, your son into your hands, oh Lord. Lord, your word says that you will mend the brokenhearted. And I believe that not only will you mentor, you mend every single person. You give them a new heart, a heart that is yeah. stayed on you, a, a heart that is tender, a responsive to yours, oh Lord. And Lord, give them your peace that surpasses all our understanding. I come against any shame that anyone might be going through, any trauma, anything that is not of you, not anything that you did not put in your sons and daughters when you created them. Father, take it out, oh Lord. Bring them to that place of safety where they know that their identity, the love, everything comes from you and comfort them, comfort them, oh Lord with only the comfort that you can provide. I pray this and I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So I love you so much. Thank you so, <laughs> so too. much. You. <sighs> thank you for this platform. This is good. This is really good. Thank you. I don't know what you're you, doing. You really, you've helped us. That's the mm. truth. You know, and like I said at the beginning, all your story, people, there's no shame. There is no shame. These things happen. And it wasn't your fault. You know, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know why we somehow, somehow always think, somehow always think that it's our fault. I could mm -hmm. have done this. I could. There's not, mm -hmm. nothing. You didn't You're a child. To you can't do it. You're yeah. a child. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. didn't have to come into this world. Totally. Oh, God. Tom, thank you so much. What's the thank you. Question? Um, um, oh, yeah. Somebody said, I hope you've forgiven all those people. I have to. It's a process. Yes. It's a process. If I can, I can call up people and there's nothing. I'm, I'm fine. I'm good. Yeah, it, it's a process. It's so it's important journey. to forgive. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if not, you're still held back. Oh, it? yeah. It holds you down. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Oh, Thanks. Lord. Can we give her a hug and <laughs> Thank show her you. how much we love her? Thank you so much, Dawn. Thank Thanks, everyone. We really, really do appreciate you. You've been so transparent and vulnerable. Wow. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> God bless.